introduce our featured guest speaker, Dr. Susan Jameson, specialist in integrative medicine. She has run our practice in Queens Road Central since 1994. Today, she'll share important information on COVID-19 testing and shed new light on, her pandem on the pandemic due to her extensive experience. Dr. Jameson graduated in Scotland and trained in Harvard and Boston hospitals in the 80s. Her first role in Hong Kong was in an infectious disease respiratory ward. She became a consulate advisor during SARS and is presently a British Council advisor. So without further ado, Dr. Jameson, if you'd like to take the microphone. Thank you very much. It's a delight to speak to the American Club. And um, I know you have a very educated audience who probably read everything in the news. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, things that I know that um, will be less obvious and things you will not read in newspapers because now they are or Google because um, I, I've got a lot more to say that it's not going to be there. So the first thing is that my first job in Hong Kong was in the tuberculosis infectious disease ward and I'm going to make it really clear how this is related to coronavirus. First of all, um, surprisingly in the 80s, 10% of deaths were due to tuberculosis in Hong Kong, even though it was a first world country, but of a third world disease. Um, both of these, um, and th this is the hospital in fact, that um, I am not managing to move forward to for some reason. That's it. Um, the Rotterdam Sanatorium was in Wan Chai. It was in those days before reclamation, you know, fresh air was a good thing. So it was right on the sea on the top of a hill to get the breeze. It was the oldest building in Hong Kong in the 80s. So very similar in that no cure had been found from this horrible infection transmitted by droplets. There were animal carriers. In fact, seals were said to have brought it from Africa to Europe. You know, all sorts of things with animals were going on. And multi, and e even um, as I worked in this hospital in the 80s, of course, by this time there were drugs, thank goodness, but multi-drug resistance. So I was treating patients and so were the nurses um, that there was no cure. So if we picked up this strain of tuberculosis, there was no cure for it, right? So, so almost it seems like a similar situation to me. Um, and I'm gonna go back to this because it, it's a very interesting um, analogy. Now, we're talking about the coronavirus, right? So this is how viruses work. We have the information, we have the, the RNA of the virus, um, that the virus, as you know by now, gets into cells and then takes over the cells and uh, mechanisms for making proteins. And then, and then the cell makes the DNA of the virus using it, all its own uh, nutrients in the cell. So it really infects and sort of kills the cell's mechanism and takes them over in a very alien-like way, I would say. Um, interestingly, um, the, the original type of virus, because it's already mutated, you know, even in a few months in China, studies have shown that Originally, it was the S strain of the virus, but that quickly mutated to the L strain. And the L strain is now 70% of the virus that's around, the S strain only 30%. So, so viruses mutate all the time. It's just what they do, right? It's, it's normal for viruses to mutate. Um, so some information that you will not um, be familiar with is coming up and this I got from a very confidential call between the head of infectious diseases in China, Stanford universities, Harvard universities and all sorts of virologists. Statistics only up to the end of March I'm afraid but it gives us a really good idea of viral um, infectivity which is so important because Koreans, South Korea are the only people in the world who did a lot of testing, right? So the fatality rate, because what we all care about is dying of this virus, not having a runny nose and sore throat for two weeks. Fatality rates um, by age group and risk by age group, this is up to the end of March. So you see only at that point, only about 100 people have died. Now it's, it's about doubled, but um, out of almost 9,000 testing, that's a lot. Um, they found 111 had died, but fatality rates by the age groups, let's look at the 50s, 0.4% risk of dying in your 50s, 1.5% in your 60s, over 70, 6.3%. So obviously very risky for the elderly. And this is why um, a lot of countries like the UK who are particularly slow 
on any measures, uh, which is why they've got so much of it. Um, you know, the first thing we did was tell elderly, was lockdown for elderly people. Um, so, so this is really interesting. And, and we know that, yes, young people have had fatalities, of course, um, but um, statistically, they are not so much the ones at risk. And also here, the asymptomatic carriers, which is something we're talking a lot about now, right? Asymptomatic positives were actually up to 20% of the total tested. So they did test 9,000 people. It was a lot before March 24. And of that 9,000 odd people, 20% were positive but had no symptoms, which as you know, is a real worry because they, they're walking around the community spreading viral infections by droplet transmission. So um, there's a large study going on in Hong Kong at the moment, 3000 people are being tested actually this week, which is really interesting because we'll soon get, I mean, next week we'll have results as to how many of them, you know, have actually had the virus and didn't have symptoms. So, uh, I think we're all familiar with the symptoms. I'm not going to talk about things you get on the news. As I say, that's not what I'm here for. However, the asymptomatic people, I mean, how infectious are they? Well, viruses, I mean, obviously coronavirus is a very infectious virus and seems to have about 10 times the fatality rate of normal influenza. However, viruses behave in a similar, similar way and they're at their most infective when you actually got, got it, you're coughing and sneezing, for instance. That means the viral load is high. Viral load is the amount of virus in your system. So more virus in your system, the more infective you are. Obviously with asymptomatic carriers, it's not that they're superhumans. <laughs> it's just that they haven't actually got much of a viral load and they've probably got a really good immune system, okay? So they have less of a viral load, therefore less infectious. And this argument goes through about um, infections, you know, do you get it from touching surfaces? Do you get it from walking by someone? Well, there's not, the whole point is there may be a bit of virus on that bit of cardboard plastic. Um, however, first of all, there's no evidence because there's such a tiny viral load and the virus is not fresh. Second thing, there's no evidence that you actually get infected from it. So having on your bits of plastic and your bits of cardboard don't necessarily mean you'll get it because of the infectivity. So I think that's, you know, knowing a bit about how, how viruses tend to work, that may be vaguely reassuring from people, but it's not vaguely reassuring, of course, to know that 20% of people may be asymptomatic carriers, right? Ah, oh, anyway, we have to give the facts here. So, what are the hopes for any drug treatment? So we'll go over this slide, which is that in the, the end of March, um, the clever and eccentric Frenchman Didier Raoult did trials on the malaria drug hydroxyquinine along with antibiotic Zithromax. And um, this is 16th of March, I believe. And um, basically, he found that in six days, 90% uh, of people, sorry, six days, only 20, these are totally, these are symptomatic coronavirus patients, right? Six days, 25% only were, had the virus by proper testing, but in the ones who hadn't had the drugs, 90% had the virus. So those were very good results. And because of this, the French um, the health minister on the 23rd of March decided to use this combination of the antimalarial drug and the antibiotic. Um, you've probably all read on the news about the equally eccentric looking Hasidic Jewish um, Dr. Vladimir Zelenko. I don't know why those guys always look eccentric and have beards, but maybe that's the nature of a, a pioneer, right? Um, you know that they're not in a white lab coat in Stanford. They're, it's not them who are doing this because um, he had another very good trial um, of 600, well, more than a trial, he treated people, Hasidic Jewish community in upstate New York, 699 people, and none of these people need ventilated. They all got better. So that's a pretty big statistic. None of them, 699, needed ventilated. 
So I just wrote this down, um, hydroxychloroquine, which is, we call it Plaquenil, and we use it in autoimmune disease. It's not really a malarial drug. I mean, it's related. More used in autoimmune disease has its side effects, especially in um, heart disease problems, increasing QT intervals. And Azithromax, which you Americans know as Z-Pak, it's a common antibiotic. And, and it, was a, it was a very brief treatment of 10 days and, and, you know, they got better very quickly, those patients. So, you know, drug trials are being done on this as we speak. But what was interesting from my, my colleagues pointed out to me that um, this um, gentleman in New York, uh, Zelenko, used zinc also. Now, zinc is very, very interesting. I'm going to show you a slide later because what it does is it, um, it's to do with the, the virus really entering the cell and destroying the cell's mechanism. Zinc actually prevents this. So zinc is a factor that unfortunately is not, you know how doctors tend to be very drug orientated, not nutrient orientated, even though it's, you know, the way it is. But zinc was used as a cofactor um, by this doctor and, and is not being used in a lot of um, trials which is unfortunate so but that's life and um, hopefully something positive will come out of this because seriously a vaccine is going to be about a year away so um, I'm going to talk about this more and move on to the next slide which is um, a little bit about masks and this is in Chinese on the right the stringy things are bacterium nice big fat bacterium E. coli Come on here if you want. Um, nice big fat bacterians. And um, on the left, we have our smaller viruses, comparative sizes. But this is from my friend, Professor Lee in the Hong Kong Hospital Authority. We gave a talk to the British Council. Definitely, this stops droplet transmission. Remember, um, the viruses are contained in the droplets, okay? So, uh, and quite possibly stop a lot of virus as well. So really worth wearing and we have to note that Hong Kong, I cross fingers, we have no new cases. How good is that in one day? We've been so successful bizarrely with this without closing all restaurants or lockdowns. So maybe this has to be looked at very seriously. And right in the beginning, the hospital authority um, were, were giving this information. Now, I'm going to move quickly on to um, why I keep talking about tuberculosis, because 18th to 20th century, one third of people in Europe died. Um, similar, very similar to um, the present days in New York, the ratio of black people dying to white was three to one. Why? Because in those days, especially under overcrowded because of poverty, living closely together, undernourished also because of poverty therefore immune system isn't so good so sadly it was changed in 200 years um the positive news here as i said there's so, there's so much you know correlation in the old days you know public health measures work so 1921 the french um who really lead the world in um the vaccine and this sort of thing um, with the pasteur institute the polio va vaccine 21 the french invented the BCG, which prevented vaccine against tuberculosis. 1940s, we invented some of these antibiotics that we now use. However, it wasn't, it wasn't this that helped um, sort out tuberculosis in the world. It was public health measures. So that's why I showed a photo of this mask first. And I think this is a very empowering, positive message that we're all waiting for this magic bullet to come along, the vaccine, the drug, and maybe, maybe not. I mean, hopefully sooner rather than later. But 90% of tuberculosis that killed one of three people in London, 90% was decreased, the infection and the death rate before there was widespread up, uptake of this vaccine. And a lot of great things came out of it, um, like the stethoscope and x-rays were invented off the back of this disastrous respiratory droplet disease. So it was good hygiene, it was sanitation, it was putting people to these sanatoriums in healthy, fresh air. 
separating them a bit from each other, getting them out of the crowded environment, encouraging them to breathe. Because we forget that oxygen is the ultimate antioxidant. And antioxidants, of course, fight all bacterium and viruses. That's our body's natural immune system, okay? So I'm going to get going to bring us back to antioxidants in a minute. Um, but this is why I like to talk. There's this very positive, um, very positive public health measure. Similarly with HIV, almost 40 people in the world have this nasty infectious disease. Nowadays, no one dies of it. Yes, because of drug. Well, that's not true. In the Western world, no one dies of it because of drugs. But before the drugs, the death rates plummeted because of public health measures, in this case, sexual health measures. Um, back to some advice, vulnerable groups. I think we all know people with heart disease are top of the list, the elderly, the diabetics. We all know this information. The slides are there to be looked at later. One of my messages, everyone is in huge fear and anxiety. Now, we all know stress really does kill. Stress will completely deplete your immune system and your immune system is your ally here. It's about your only one right now, to be quite honest. <laughs> That's it. So I would suggest that we have to be positive. We, ha we don't hang around the anxiety inducers. I have a patient right now who watches uh, news five hours a day and I just had to give antidepressants to. Um, that, that's, you know, one gets addicted, right? Oh, I don't want to miss anything. I want the latest news. I mean, I feel like that too. I'm a human being. Take responsibility for your stress levels and your positivity. We all talk about cortisol ruining our immune system, but in fact, um, th there's a hundred other factors that, not just the cortisol, but a hundred other neurotransmitters that have a knock-on effect to our immune system. So I love to make this point to people. And the practical tips, eating well, healthy foods, try and get exercise in, you know, nature. And uh, we all know about social isolating. So take a look at the slide later because so much to talk about, right? I'm going to talk about, we've talked about boosting your immune system, how a third world countries are going to be so badly hit by this because of overcrowding and malnourishment due to poverty, so their immune system isn't so great. For instance, did you know that vitamin C, which is great at boosting your immune system, has a direct effect at killing viruses also? Not many people know this. Um, so studies have been done in China, high dose vitamin C um, really does kill viruses. I use it in my practice all the time for shingles, um, Epstein Barr virus causing chronic fatigue. So I, I use it all the time uh, to kill viruses. So I'm not surprised to hear this. Uh, also, that's the virus killing aspect. Um, but maybe what you don't know is if you have a cold, a simple coronavirus cold, <laughs> within 24 hours, all the vitamin C in your body is depleted because um, it's used up, you know, the amount we get from our lovely green vegetables and citrus fruits, it's used up really quickly. Um, by the, the, the body's immune system, right? So that's why supplements work. Supplements do work. So um, Harvard EDU did an, um, tells us very clearly that after 1,000 milligrams orally, it's not, you know, one to 2,000, say, it's not really particularly absorbed orally. So we have to give it intravenously, which is why we do shots of it both with people with, you know, say you've got influenza, you've got any infectious disease due to virus, Epstein-Barr, shingles. There are protocols for all these things and do it IV. One of the places you can go to very easily um, and it's medically supervised with great nurses and doctors is Revive. Revive Hong Kong give you booster shots of vitamin B, IM and vitamin C. So I've just written this down. Uh, and some studies, but I've got many more studies, you know, of the, of the coronavirus treatment, because obviously they're quite new, coronavirus treatment of vitamin C. Moving on, a uh, bit of a blurry slide, but zinc is so important. I uh, remember I said it's, um, it really works in the cell in coronavirus. It's got, um, I mean, a bit like tuberculosis, back to a tuberculosis here. Tuberculosis, the, the bacterium didn't kill anyone, tuberculosis. The body's immune system went crazy, just like coronavirus. So coronavirus kills people because this huge inflammatory reaction, we call it a cytokine storm. 
inflammatory mediators go crazy. So we want to modulate our immune system. We don't want to particularly, we don't want it going crazy. There is a difference. So um, zinc deficiency um, will cause all sorts of horrible things to our basic white blood cells. That's the B and T, T killer cells. Um, zinc, um, it, it totally balances our immune system. So this is quite um, a nice slide here talking about balance. Macrophages are the big cells that go and gobble up all the weak infected cells, T killer cells. So um, antibodies um, are the white blood cell antibodies. B cells um, attack substances it doesn't like in the cells, but the killer T cells will gobble them up more. So I've made a package for people who want everything put together, the right amount of zinc, the right amount of C and other things here. If it can be of help to people, all my patients take this daily to protect them against any infection, but specifically, I've had help from a virologist making this as a protection against viral infection. And we've got two things that are really interesting here that have been studied in trials. Um, nutraceuticals, so astragalus is a Chinese herb used for centuries as a preventative and it's a bit like ginseng, it's called an adaptogenic, it balances the immune system, right? It doesn't overstimulate, um, it balances it, adaptogenic. It actually helps raise white blood cells, it's actually been studied to be antiviral, antioxidant, so that, that's in my immune boosting package and I can recommend anyone to take this if you want to take it separately at around one gram a day. And then we've got another one here, um, Sambucus nigra, elderberry, but these are, it's better used together with a cofactor to other herbs. This is to, to help your natural protection. Actually reduces cellular um, viral entry and it um, helps in immune factors, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and tumor necrosis factor, TNF. So this is obviously of interest to people for babies over the age of one also. All my patients are on this. And well, I haven't seen any infections yet, so cross my fingers. Um, look after yourself. This is the time to get a checkup, right? I mean, we're all captive here in Hong Kong. And um, this is the immune system, a cell-mediated immunity. The antibodies, um, cell-mediated immune, different, different phases of the immune system, natural killer T cells, I love those. Producing your lymph, your spleen, your thymus. And complements another part of the immune system. So um, I do checkups and patients for this, and you might want to go to your own doctor also, because I mean, anything wrong with you will affect your immune system, liver, kidney, a bit of anemia. Um, however, this is specifically to do with your immune system, so um, always nice to look after yourself. Useful information here, um, I'm sure you all have access to this stuff, but I always include it anyway. And I'd be delighted to take any questions you may have, and um, I've got a few extra things to say if, um, if you don't. So th thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Jameson. Um, I'm finding it hard to formulate questions as you've, as you've covered all the bases already. I did my best there. Yeah, I did my best very quickly. <laughs> no, it was very good. Thank you. Um, I, we were wondering, would you be able to provide any additional information? Um, because there's been a bit of a debate in terms of incubation period for the coronavirus. Um, there's been like so much different data shared on how, the, how long yeah. the period is and oh, this is it this is it um it seems to be generally about five days uh remember we've got the asymptomatic carriers so they i mean you know mm -hmm. lots of people who've actually you know how effective are they they will vary so that's a different question isn't it um mm -hmm. but it's generally about five days but it could be up to uh, two weeks um so mm -hmm. average is five days and yeah, because not enough proper studies have been done on this. But uh, my la laboratory I use has come back to me and share this information. Um, mm. uh, uh, that's it really. Testing I didn't cover, you know. So testing blood or sputum sample, deep throat. Mm -hmm. okay. And that, that, that's another one. The testing, blood is really easy to test and it gives you an idea. Um, 
you know, if you pick up the virus yesterday and you're just incubating it, it will take a few days to have some antibody production and we're testing for antibodies in the blood. When I see a few, three to five days. So I suppose what we're saying is really, um, the blood test can be positive once the incubation period has, you know, once you've got enough viral load to detect it. Mm. Um, whereas the deep sputum sample is going to be actually looking for virus um, very closely. And so it's a, it's a slightly different test. Mm. And could you shed light on whether uh, the blood test or the sputum test would be more accurate? Or would you say that both... Um, both are rather accurate depending yeah, on... Well, okay, we, we call it specificity and sensitivity with blood tests. That means false positive and false negative. Now, your false mm -hmm. positives are what you... Sorry, um, I don't think you're going to have many false positives, uh, but the false negatives is what we really worry about. And, the, the, you know, we don't want to miss things, right? So mm -hmm. the lab I use has 98% um, specificity and sensitivity, which is roughly 98% false positive and false negative. So, okay, which is really good for any laboratory test that's normal because any test, I'm afraid, has false positives and negatives. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the thing is, as I said, if you, you have to wait, Three to, three to five days um, after a patient is infected, you'll start to get the antibodies enough to test. Right. So I guess that would be the false negative, right, if you do it too early. Mm -hmm. the, other okay. the other test will have false negatives. That's the deep, the um, testing pl PCR polymerase chain reaction. That's a test for the DNA of the virus, PCR test from the actual deep throat stuff. Because as, as you know from the press and all, um, the virus starts replicating in the throat first and then when it, it causes real problems when it goes into the lungs. And it's nasty little spiky exterior, has a great affinity for cells and sticks very nicely. Mm -hmm. So that test, um, you're going to get false negatives simply because people aren't doing the test properly, right? I mean, you know, um, mm -hmm. if you give someone a throat swab, they'll never do a proper test themselves. Um, it's difficult to do a proper test. Um, patients don't like it. It's un really uncomfortable, border borderline painful. You stick it up uh, really quite far up the nose or quite far down the throat. First thing in the morning is the test we do for sputum when they have not eaten or drunk anything and you really get a patient to cough stuff up and okay, it's a bit of saliva there, okay, but it's first thing in the morning and you really cough, believe me, you'll get stuff from your throat up and, and that is a good sample and much less likely to have the false um, negatives. Great, um, that definitely answers the question. Um, yeah, because it's a really good question, and I know there's confusion over it, over it, but we can be quite definite about it now. Um, yeah, we can. Uh, and anything else you're particularly thinking of asking right now? Um, I think that's all on my end. Um, and if, Jameson, I just mm -hmm. yeah, okay, well, I feel yeah. worried about surfaces and touching surfaces. Um, so I wanted to so you know you know that Princess cruise ship. Um, well, there was virus found there after 19 days in the rooms that had not been cleaned. Now, yeah, virus found there, it hangs around. Was it live? Could it have infected anyone? No. So that people not thinking, you know, you have to know how viruses work, right? Um, sec secondly, the study in New England Journal of Medicine that showed that in... Um, I don't know why they did it on copper, metal, I guess. Copper, it lasted for four hours. Cardboard, 24 hours, one day. Plastic and steel, one and a half days. So, but again, could that have infected someone, right? That's a different question because the viral load is tiny and it's not very active. Obviously, it's a possible, but it's a very small possible, but still a possible, which is why... Obviously, people are being so careful to touch things, you know, taxi door handles, doorknobs. So, so I, th I know people always ask that question. So I, th yeah. I think we covered a lot there, I think, that is, is kind of up to date and also that you won't read in the press, which was my intention. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Dr. Jameson, um, thank you so much on behalf of the club and members. Um, their professional insight on COVID-19 has definitely, um, we've picked up a lot of valuable information that we can use today. Um, and it's been a real, real pleasure. So thank you so much. It's been lovely talking to you guys and we can do it again um, anytime. But I guess you've got the recording, which is fabulous. Yes. And so this will be uh, shared.